I'm Elaine Sisman, a delegate from the American Musicological Society, uh, and I've been privileged to be chair of the board, uh, sorry, chair of the executive committee of delegates and therefore uh, a member of the board. Uh, the first time I was ever at an ACLS meeting, it was as the president of the American Musicological Society, and it was this session uh, that I happened into. Uh, it, it used to be later in the morning at a time when I was more easily available, uh, and it, it stunned me uh, in the breadth and excellence of the intellectual projects that the ACLS supports. Uh, one of the great things about ACLS is that it supports scholars at all stages of their careers. Uh, and so we will be hearing today from uh, a doctoral fellow, uh, someone from the Central Fellowship working as an assistant professor, uh, and a more senior scholar. So I'm delighted to uh, introduce them. I will be introducing them in turn. Uh, we'll be speaking, they'll be speaking uh, about their work uh, for about 10 or 10 or 15 minutes each uh, consecutively, and then we'll take questions directed to uh, any of the three uh, for which there are microphones around the room. Uh, so to begin, our first speaker is Stephen Berry, uh, the 2013 ACLS Digital Innovation Fellow, uh, Professor, Department of History, University of Georgia. I won't be telling you uh, their CVs because they're in the program book, uh, but his project is called CSI Dixie. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I want to start by thanking everyone at the ACLS, not merely the jury that made the award, but everyone who helped get me here and gave me the opportunity to present to you all today. Uh, for all kinds of reasons, I am reluctant to put this particular slide up. So that gap-toothed goofus in the center is me trying to get a laugh out of my brother and sister with my favorite toy that I'd just gotten for Christmas, this chattering skull. Uh, looking at this, I realized that I really was a death-obsessed little kid. The way I figured it, the dead had done at least one thing I hadn't, they'd died. And so strangely, they could teach me how to live, what we needed to live up to, and maybe especially what we needed to live down. Ultimately, and perhaps predictably, this preoccupation led me to the coroner's reports of the 19th century U.S. South. I can't tell you what it's like to open a box of these inquests and realize that every neatly trifolded little bundle is the story of how one person went out of the world. If I'm addicted to stories of mortality, then coroner's reports are like mainlining death. <laughs> Here there are no beginnings, only endings. Every death is different, and yet all are somehow the same. Now, the coroner is as old as death and taxes and related to both. In medieval England, if the sheriff was the king's guard dog charged with keeping the peace, the coroner was the king's vulture charged with scavenging the countryside in search of potential revenue. The word coroner itself comes from corona, Latin for crown. Whenever disaster loosed property from its legal moorings, whether by shipwreck, fire, or act of God, wherever a coin fell from a private pocket into the public square, as in cases of buried treasure, the circling coroner was apt to descend. The medieval coroner did, as today, investigate sudden, sudden deaths, but he did so less to establish cause or criminality than to determine if the crown could turn a profit in the reaper's wake. Where the coroner suspected suicide, the crown could claim the estate. Where the coroner found a dead Norman on the village commons, which evidently happened a lot, the crown could levy a fine called the murderum from which the word murder derives. By the 19th century, the coroner's sole focus was the convening of inquests, which in addition to serving a legal purpose, functioned, I suggest, as a kind of community theater. Here we have a cartoon uh, from 1826. I know it's hard to read the caption. Uh, one of the jurors, the uh, men clustered on the right, says, the man's alive, sir, for he's opened one eye. And the coroner, the figure uh, in the center, says, sir, the doctor declared him dead two hours since, and he must remain dead, sir. <laughs> so I shall proceed with the inquest. This one cartoon actually does a great job of taking us inside the overlapping layers of authority at an inquest. Hovering over all is the civil authority, since everyone is here to investigate whether someone has killed, as the language went, against the peace and dignity of the state. 
We also see the authority of class embodied in the figure on the left, very comfortable and well-fed. Religion, the priest sort of lurking behind him, and medicine, the absent doctor who has already made his pronouncement. But we see the authority of common sense, too, in the masses, who may not bring expertise to the table, but they have knowledge of local circumstances, like in this case, who's dead and who is not. And of course, we have the authority of death itself, which cuts against the professional class distinctions, holding out a certain social leveling, a sense that everybody dies, however unequally. And finally, we have a sense of how, in all these inequalities, the social world of the 19th century was still smaller, less formal, and less clinical. There's a certain intimacy here, everybody facing death together and facing each other in the same small space. Just to give you a sense of the anatomy, anatomy of an inquest, here's a typical report. You get the place, in this case, in the woods near William Gardner's. You get a date, in this case, the 4th of January in the year of our Lord, 1817. You get the name of the coroner, Joseph Patterson. You get a body of Alexander McKee. You get the jury that has been impaneled to stand over that body. And you get a judgment, always in this phrasing. Do say upon their oaths. In this case, William McKee was judged deranged or insane. He escaped from his family uh, and died of exposure. But a typical coroner's inquest includes more than just this. So in this case, we get a minority report. One of the jurors has disagreed uh, with the wet rest of the people uh, on the panel. In this case, a man named Janot had been tasked with taking a slave to the jail, but the slave could barely walk. So Janot lashed a chain around the slave's neck and dragged him behind his horse until he was decapitated. And this guy thinks maybe that is wrong. Maybe that is too far. The rest of the jury disagreed and let him go. You also get slave voices. In this case, this is a 12-year-old slave girl who is giving her deposition, her testimony, her words, her version of what had happened. And you also get poor whites. In this case, every one of these men has made their mark. That you see in the middle of their name, Benjamin, and then there's an X, Humphreys. What I am uh, interested in uh, I've searched thousands of reports from the 19th century. I've found evidence that would support studies of antebellum abortion, child abuse, spousal abuse, master-slave murder, and slave-on-slave -slave violence. Now, to be sure, one might get glimpses of these same things in more traditional court records, but especially in the Old South, cases like these had a way of not quite percolating up through the court system. And this says nothing of cases in which nothing actionable occurred, cases of suicide, accidental death, or act of God. Now. Obviously, no society should be judged solely by its morgue, but I believe every society has to answer for its morgue. And that is my particular point. What I am most interested in is in cases of racially motivated murder. And one of my inspirations is the Cold Case Project at coldcases.org. It's supported by the Center for Investigative Reporting. Obviously, in the 1960s, civil rights activists were occasionally gunned down in their driveways. Everyone knew the Klan did it, but justice was never served. There's no statute of limitation on murder. So cold cases says, let's roll them up. And they have rolled some people up. Now, obviously, in my case, justice can never be served. Everyone is already dead. But there is a kind of justice in knowing the truth and in setting the record straight. This brings me to another of my inspirations. This is a paper uh, by my friend Amy Ross. The paper is titled, The Body Counts, Civilian Casualties in the Crisis of Human Rights. In it, Amy argues that the first step in any truth and reconciliation campaign is to count the dead and give them names. Because, as I say, when every body matters, everybody matters. So this is what CSI Dixie looks like right now. It's really just a lot of spreadsheets. It seems pretty impersonal, given the gritty realities we're dealing with. But there's always a benefit to aggregating data. So for instance, we now know that in Spartanburg County, South Carolina, between 1840 and 1880, if you were a white male and the coroner was standing above your body, you died of a combination of alcohol and stupidity. <laughs> and if you were a white female, you hung yourself. And a black male, 
you hung yourself. Not were hung by somebody else. You hung yourself. We have this idea that the Old South was a violent place, a place of dueling knife fights and eye gouging. It is more accurate to call it a self-destructive place, a land of rampant alcoholism, a place where white men drank themselves and their dependents to death. In fact, what you learn at the morgue is what you ought to have known if you'd really thought about it in the first place. So for instance, what you learn is that in a place that doesn't teach kids to swim, many of them will drown. Thus, on May 5, 1860, did a large group of teenagers set off on a May Day fishing party at the Boykin Mill Pond. Their raft hit a snag, and more than 25 drowned, including all five children from one family. And what you learn is that in a world without treatment programs or social services, spouses and children will suffer the most. Thus, on September 7, 1857, was a Mrs. Cox strolling a backcountry road when she came across 16-year-old Jane Arnold stretched out on the ground with a baby beside her, bleeding from its umbilical cord. Arnold called out to Mrs. Cox, who wrapped the dying infant in an apron and took it into a nearby house. Mrs. Cox then returned and asked the girl why she hadn't given birth indoors. Because her daddy was dogging her, the girl said, and had cast her from the house. She seemed to be grieving, Cox told the coroner in a model of understatement, but I don't know what for, whether on the part of her dead child or the abuse of her father. A year and a half later, I find Jane Arnold, Jane Arnold again, cast out of the house, living in an abandoned school where her latest baby has died of exposure. And what you learn is that in a world without birth control, you will have a lot of dead babies. In 1870, Catherine Berry, a domestic in the R.C. Poole household, was told that she would be terminated if she was indeed pregnant. In an awful feat of endurance, she continued with her chores until doubled over with pain, she snuck away to give birth in the potato shed. Reeling from the loss of blood, she still managed to strangle the baby and fling it into the Pacolet River, where it landed at the feet of some fishermen. Such stories could be multiplied literally a hundredfold. And find you, finally, what you learn is that in a world that brutalizes African Americans, some few will become brutes. Enslavement does not magically transform everyone who endures it into savvy, self-sustaining freedom fighters. If we're going to grant the enslaved their full humanity, we must grant that like any other group of people, they occasionally fought, fornicated, and got into petty disputes that sometimes took a murderous turn. To be sure, as historian Stephen Hahn has noted, the slave quarter produced one of the most radical and transformative politics ever seen in America, a politics that produced Nat Turner and Frederick Douglass and finally brought down a $3.5 billion interest. But in coroner's reports, we get a glimpse of the violence that existed within the slave community that we knew had to be there. Thus did the slaves of the Hale Plantation turn their children over to Tamer, the enslaved nurse, on their way out to the fields, little knowing that she liked to punish the children by tying them too close to a fire, a practice that was only discovered when she finally cooked one of them to death. I could go on, but already you have a sense that the view from the South's coroner's office is unrelentingly bleak. Taken individually, the deaths are senseless and sad and unredeemed by tragedy. But quite honestly, that's a lot of what death is. We're just not good at facing it, not in the past and not now. We're not always good at realizing that who dies, when, where, and how is the greatest social justice question there is. Now, this is what CSI Dixie will look like at launch at the end of the year. In closing, I want to say a few words about how I think projects like this can help those of us in the digital humanities rethink form as well as content. CSI Dixie is at once an archive, a blog, a teaching resource, an online magazine, and perhaps most important to me, what I call a deconstructed monograph. I refer here to the cooking term, uh, not the school of literary criticism. When complete, this will be everything a monograph would be. Charts, tables, graphs, archival research, and 100,000 words of original scholarship but it has all been left slightly disaggregated and thereby more flexible. It can be read through and around in different ways. You can check the text against the sources and vice versa. I can take criticism and make changes and then take criticism on the changes because it is not just a self-published work, but an endlessly self-republished work. It is not a snapshot of a work in progress, but a work in progress forever, a ship always at sea. And whether she sinks or sails, I will always be grateful to the ACLS for giving her her bon voyage. Thank you.
Thank you, Stephen Berry. I love the idea of the, de the deconstructed, open-ended death study. Our second speaker is Lori Kachatorian, Assistant Professor of Near Eastern Studies at Cornell University. Uh, she is a 2013 ACLS Fellow. Uh, the title of her project is The Satrapal Condition, Archaeology and the Matter of Empire. Lori. Thank you, Elaine. <clears throat> As a, a junior faculty member, let me begin by saying that I had no idea precisely how blissful a year of leave uh, could be. This has been the most productive, gratifying, and quiet professional year, or year of my professional life, so let me extend my, my sincerest thanks to this organization. I am an archaeologist, although I won't be speaking about death today. <laughs> And uh, for the past decade, I've been conducting research in Armenia, a post-Soviet Republic of the Caucasus. The historical period that has held my attention is the mid-first millennium BC, when Armenia was a province or satrapy of the Persian Empire, often dubbed the first world empire, because it was the largest political formation that humanity had yet seen. It is also the one famed, as every child learns, for its role as the paradigmatic foil to democratic Greece and indeed Western civilization. From antiquity to the present, visual expressions of this Orientalist trope abound. You've probably seen posters for the movie 300 and its sequel, 300 Rise of an Empire, that cast the Persians in this iconic role as violent, irrational Oriental despots. One of my favorites is this cover uh, of The Economist that appeared in summer 2013 as America and its allies flirted with intervention in the Syrian civil war in the face of mounting Iranian influence over the regime of Bashar al-Assad. Can Iran be stopped, ran the headline. The cover image featured a sculptural relief from a palatial structure at the Persian capital Persepolis, located in today's southwestern Iran, it shows a lion digging its fangs and claws into the rump of a rearing bull. In the opinion of the magazine, the West should enter the Syrian fray to check the ambitions of, quote, a Persian lion that has not lost its claws. What is most fascinating about this cover is neither the facile analogy that it draws between the Islamic Republic of Iran and the Persian Empire, nor the way in which the economist strives to awaken long dormant anxieties of unleashed Persian despotism that reside deep in the Western historical consciousness. Rather, the magazine's cover is of great interest to me for how succinctly, if inadvertently, it encapsulates why it is difficult to fathom a serious contribution to political and social thought that derives from the cultural production of ancient Persia. The Economist seems to elide predatory ferocity with state aggression and thus calls up a visceral exercise of power that is closed off to rational thought, one that is animalistic, motivated by innate compulsion rather than mindful reflection on the nature of sovereignty and its means of reproduction. As it turns out, the metaphor could not be further from the scholarly understandings of this scene, but this is the ancient Persia that most of us know. We have generally hesitated to look at ancient Iran as a means to stimulate abstractions for the humanistic social sciences because of a prevailing suspicion of Persian political reflection as primeval, pre-rational, and grounded in nothing more than an insatiable thirst for power. Here is where my project steps in. What motivates my research is an effort to take more seriously the cultural production of ancient Persia, not only as a unique historical phenomenon, but a source for political and archaeological theory. More specifically, I am interested in how Persian thought can contribute to our thinking on imperial sovereignty, and particularly its relation to physical matter. This is a project that contributes to the so-called material turn in the humanistic and social sciences, and particularly its engagement with problems of power. What brings these two themes together, sovereignty and matter, is my titular concept, the satrapal condition. 
Now, this word satrapy may seem rather alien to most of you, though I'd like to suggest that it's not quite that foreign. In fact, this old and obscure word has recently acquired new currency in the vernacular of contemporary world politics. If the media is any gauge, since 9-11, satrapies have proliferated on a global scale. No surprise that on the ledger of putative satrapal sovereigns, the United States tops the charts. In the decade that followed the 2003 Iraq War, commentators in leading world newspapers and across the blogosphere repeatedly opined that the US had made satrapies out of Iraq, Afghanistan, and Pakistan. According to Stephen Lee Myers of the New York Times, in 2009, Defense Secretary Robert Gates assured Congress that Iraq's leaders, quote, do not intend for the post-Saddam Iraq to become a satrapy of its neighbor to the east, Iran. Others joined him in returning satrapy to its place of origin. The editors of The Guardian recently admonished, Iran must know that the Sunni Arab world cannot be transformed into a series of satrapies subservient to Tehran. Beyond the Middle East, journalists have remarked that Britain has long maintained its satrapy of Scotland, that China has made satrapies of Myanmar and parts of Sub-Saharan Africa, and that financial crisis allowed Germany to make a satrapy out of Greece. Talk of sat meanwhile, excuse me, meanwhile, Russia has tried to establish or reestablish satrapies from the Caucasus to the Crimea. Talk of satrapies today implicitly unsettles the modernist conceit that imperialism's latest incarnations represent entirely novel forms of macro-political ambition. Clearly, the political repertoires of the deep past are still with us today. And yet, the word satrapy itself is far more complex than these usages suggest. This is a term of rich but unrealized analytical potential derived from an obscure body of ancient Persian political philosophy. It is a term that I press into service in my book by examining various sources of evidence in which we encounter the root word, Old Persian chashasa, on which the ancient Greek satrapes is built. Chashasa roughly means sovereignty or dominion. I look closely at various royal inscriptions and Persian stone reliefs such as these that represent this concept. I also look at a later corpus of ancient Iranian materials, namely select Zoroastrian liturgical texts in which this word for sovereignty appears and where it is linked inextricably to matter, especially molten and formed metal. To summarize some findings from these analyses, the Persian metaphysics of power advanced a rather unique sense of sovereignty in three respects. First, Persian thinkers posited an ontological indivisibility of sovereignty as both a prerogative of rule and a sphere of earthly exertion. That is, sovereignty is both a priori to the polity itself, granted by God, in this case Ahura Mazda, and at the same time, an a posteriori power that is dependent on experience. Sovereignty is also fragile. It is viable, open to alteration or displacement by practical human action. And lastly, sovereignty exists through and is dependent upon physical matter. Things make imperialism possible. Now, you may be asking yourself what any of this has to do with archaeology. <clears throat> Perhaps contrary to popular perceptions, archaeology has a developed body of thought on how we are to understand the work of things in human societies. So we have much to contribute to the wider turn to matter of the last decade. Much has been said in this recent literature on the ontology of things, long banished by human-centered Cartesian thought to the margins of philosophy and social theory. Theorists have probed what things are, what are their capacities, how do we relate to them, and how do they relate to us? My project's contribution to this conversation is on the terrain of the political. In response to calls for a post-humanist political theory that attends to the material constitution of political association, Political theorists are increasingly recasting things from the outcasts to participants in the public sphere. Yet such theories advance a rather constricted sense of the political that narrowly encompasses representational democracies. 
There is talk of object-oriented democracy, of the race of the race publica, and of the vibrant matter of the pluralist demos. What seems to matter is the matter of the contemporary democratic developed West. But of course, political association is not exhausted by Western humanities democratic projects. To attend only to the race of the race publica is to limit our awareness of political matter to what can only be considered outlier polities in the long history of formalized human political affairs. A more fully materialist theory of politics that attends to the powers of non-humans in political life must account for the different ways in which humans and things come into association under different constellations of power. My project develops a working analytic to imperial things that accounts for the nodes of intersection between the physical properties that matter possesses and the politics in which it can be enlisted. After five millennia of experience with imperialism, we have come to understand that the relations between humans and things recurrently produce coercion, extraction, compromise, mimicry, complicity, and revolt played out across vast distances and across sundry social boundaries. Humanity's role in these affairs is by now rather well understood. But we have yet to think concertedly about the performance of non-sentient things in realizing the conditions of empire. Such exertions are made possible and at times undermined by thingly partners that I call delegates, proxies, affiliates, and captives. Now, I won't take the time to explain this four-part schematic. Instead, let me conclude with one example from my excavations that illustrate, uh, excuse me, illustrates how I put these concepts to work. The fieldwork took place at a site called Tsakhkahovit in central Armenia. I draw your attention to an area of the settlement called Precinct A, and specifically Room G. In situ on the floor of this room were the following objects. A serpentine plate, a ceramic stand whose diameter neatly matches that of the base of the plate, and a basalt mortar. The serpentine plate is what I call a delegate, and the objects with which it occurs combine to suggest a rather effective assemblage that helped create satrapal conditions in this town. Petrographic and mineralogical analyses indicate that the plate is made of a stone that traces to a source in the Zagros Mountains of Iran, and it in fact appears to be a material on which the Persian court was quite dependent. In a building at Persepolis known as the Treasury, excavators recovered nearly 300 green shirt and serpentine plates. Almost all are identical in form to the imported plate from Armenia. Also in the treasury were green shirt mortars and pestles. The plate is a delegate first on account of its physical properties. The relative scarcity of the stone, its admired color, and its hardness, which required specialized carvers, combined to ensnare imperial elites who came to value the substance, to regulate its flows, to care for it. The plate is also a delegate because in combination with mortar and pestle, it afforded, through direct somatic encounter, a practice that the sovereign establishment clearly regarded as important. You see here royal ceilings that depict these objects, footless plates, mortar, and pestle, in ceremonial context, framed under the god Ahura Mazda, with individuals standing before a low stand or altar. The ritual actions that the plate and associated objects permitted in their linkage to the divine guarantor of the Persian realm were relevant to imperial metaphysics. Scholars associate the Persepolis assemblage with a well-known Zoroastrian ritual involving a plate, mortar, and pestle used for the crushing of a plant and the consumption of its juices. The objects thus conglomerate values linked to the institutions of priesthood and political power. I suggest that the ritual requiring plates and mortars at Persepolis also took place at Tsakhkohovit. The delegate in room G and the assemblage with which it worked brought people of the town into a dependence upon new substances, new forms, and the esoteric values that they enabled. The plate and its assemblage enabled the enactment of a practice that made present a ritual entanglement of a divinely sanctioned imperial polity. It appears that the delegate acted as a reliable, dutiful political actor, helping to create subjects who participated in a political religious institution that was tightly bound to imperial norms and values. Now, not all objects of empire are quite so obedient. 
but so as not to myself be insubordinate by going over my allotted time. I'll leave the matter of uh, disobedience for another time. Thank you very much. Thank you for giving us a new way to understand delegates and a room full of them. <laughs> Our third speaker is Laura Turner Igo, doctoral candidate in the Department of Art History at the Tyler School of Art, Temple University. She is a 2013 Henry Luce Foundation ACLS dissertation fellow in American art uh, for her dissertation project, The Opulent City and the Sylvan State, Art and Environmental Embodiment in Early National Philadelphia. Laura. Thank you. It is truly an honor uh, to be included in the program and to share with you my research today. Uh, I am extremely grateful to the ACLS and the Henry Luce Foundation for funding my research and writing this year uh, and allowing me to actually complete my dissertation, which I am pleased to announce that I'm defending in just a couple of weeks. <laughs> oh, thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. So what role does environmental change play in the development of fine arts and material culture? And how might the visual arts affect environmental perception? These questions driving my current research were inspired by an encounter with a group of miniature fireplace and stove models in the collection of the American Philosophical Society in Philadelphia, attributed to the father-son artists Charles Wilson and Raphael Peel. A respected portrait painter during the early republic, Charles Wilson Peale founded one of the first museums of art and science in North America, which he represented in this rather grandiose self-portrait painted near the end of his life. Raphael Peale is best known today for his still life paintings, recently reevaluated as phenomenological projections of the artist's own body by Alexander Nemiroff, who is speaking in a session this afternoon. In 1796, the Peels submitted their models to an American Philosophical Society contest for fuel-efficient fireplaces or stoves in response to a rapid depletion of easily accessible firewood, which nearly tripled in price during the second half of the 18th century. The Peels, under the pseudonym Economy, won the premium from the Society for their designs in 1799 and received the first patent for a fireplace in the United States. To me, these models demonstrated an acknowledgement of and creative engagement with environmental change impacting urban life during the early national period that had not been previously examined in art historical scholarship. We have, been, we have increasingly become accustomed to 20th and 21st century artists confronting ecological change in their art. An exhibition that closed only recently at the Chemical Heritage Foundation in Philadelphia investigated visualizations of regional environmental alteration and climate change by several contemporary artists, including Diane Burko, Von Bell, and Katie Holton. On April 27th, in an event associated with the exhibition, artist Eve Mosher and community members of Port Richmond, a neighborhood in North Philadelphia, traced a bold chalk line in order to demarcate areas that would be affected by flooding due to projected climate change an especially poignant investigation in the wake of Hurricane Sandy. In my dissertation, I posit that environmental conditions and ecological change also played an instrumental part in shaping and resisting artistic production several decades prior to the modern articulation of ecology as a scientific concept in the late 19th century. I consider a variety of different media in order to demonstrate that the human body served as a powerful creative metaphor in early national Philadelphia, not only for understanding and representing natural processes in political or aesthetic terms, but also for framing critical public discourse about the city's actual environmental conditions. A number of art historians have explored the role of the body and science in Philadelphia circa 1800, greatly enriching our understanding of the interdisciplinary relationships linking art to medicine, natural history, and politics in this context. This scholarship, however, has not adequately examined how artists grappled with the actual environmental predicament posed by the city's rapid ecological transformation. An engraving attributed to Charles Wilson Peale conveys the widespread development of the landscape surrounding Philadelphia by the late 18th century. Even while the Delaware countryside in Peel's engraving appears fertile and prosperous, 
the prominent gnarled tree, along with the lone, uh, the lone stump in the right foreground, which you can sort of see here, serve as visual remnants of the abundant forests that recede into the background. Philadelphia and surrounding communities consumed massive amounts of wood for ships, building construction, and fuel. Yellow fever periodically swept through the city beginning in 1793, decimating the local population and raising concerns about contaminated air and water, prompting plans for city waterworks by 1798. In their 2009 anthology, A Keener Perception, Alan Braddock and Christoph Ermscher advocated for an environmental turn in, in cultural interpretation as a way for the humanities to contribute to a broader reimagination of environmental relations, responsibilities, and possibilities facing our planet today. Despite a growing interest in eco-criticism in literary studies and other humanities disciplines, art historians frequently overlook artistic engagement with environmental change and, correspondingly, the impact of these changes on visual and material production. Briefly summarized, eco-criticism expands the scope of scholarly inquiry by recovering lost or neglected evidence of environmental conditions that bear on politics, society, and culture. Studying past conceptions of the environment may better help us understand how certain ideas, whether beneficial, misguided, or destructive, gain prominence in our culture today. The recognition that human bodies are directly affected by their environments in the past as well as the present forces us to acknowledge that humans are objects as well as agents of environmental change. Conversely, the environment becomes more than an object upon which chain is enacted. It is also an agent that acts upon the bodies inhabiting it. This recovery of the vibrant matter of natural and built environments, a concept recently explored by political theorist Jane Bennett, and I would argue recognized by the artists and architects I study, complicates the predominant understanding of the Enlightenment project as a triumph of science, universalizing reason, and colonization. While Philadelphia artists struggled to maintain order and control over the urban landscape and its hinterlands, they continually met resistance as pollution increased, waterworks and canals failed to harness rivers, and wood decayed. The materiality of natural resources, whether wood, air, or water, therefore challenged perceptions of nature as inanimate. Drawing from the object-oriented ontologies of Bruno Latour, Timothy Morton, Jane Bennett, and others, my project questions the binaries that have long separated matter, things, and beings in the studies and studies of the early national period. A critical analysis of representations and relics of Penn's treaty elm, the symbolic tree under which William Penn was believed to have made an agreement of peace with the Lenape Indians, frames the introduction and conclusion of my manuscript. This elm, featured prominently in Thomas and William Russell Birch's engraving of the city port on the right, collapsed in an 1810 storm, and its wood was converted into a variety of relics, including the box on the left, owned by the antiquarian John Fanning Watson. I argue that these cultural relics fostered an ecological sensibility by demonstrating an intimate connection between human and environmental history, as the elm's wood was disseminated throughout the region and abroad. Another chapter examines the remarkable transformation of Benjamin Latrobe's Center Square Waterworks from a cele celebrated site of civic achievement and public health to one of spectacle and corruption. While I argue that Latrobe's deep knowledge of biological processes, hydrology, and interrelated systems framed his aesthetic perceptions of and designs for the waterworks in 1798, the Center Square engine house was plagued with bodily associations of obstruction and blockage. William Rush's unusual terracotta self-portrait, showing the sculptor's head rising from the knotty trunk of a terracotta pine tree, serves as the focal point of my third chapter. I argue that this self-portrait by the city's most prominent woodcarver illuminates an increasingly fraught and mediated corporeal relationship to the American environment, as the recognition of scarcity and extinction challenged earlier beliefs in the plenitude of nature. In each of my case studies, I investigate the myriad ways bodies and environmental factors collaborated and collided in creative responses to problems like deforestation, water and air pollution, and public health, issues which Peel, Latrobe, Rush, and their contemporaries confronted explicitly in their works. While we may not call these early national works of visual and material culture environmentalist in their message, they sometimes facilitated and at other times obscured an understanding about the natural world as an arena of dynamic transformation. 
So let us return again to the Peel's unusual fireplace and stove models, the focus of my first chapter of my dissertation, and specifically an additional device designed by Charles Wilson Peel called a smoke eater. This stove, constructed and installed in Peel's museum by 1788, not, excuse me, 1798, drew smoke back down into the fire to undergo combustion a second time, expelling clean warm air outside of the building via hidden pipes underneath the floor. According to this extant engraving and accompanying descriptions, the smoke eater was shaped like a classical column, plastered and painted white to resemble marble, and topped with a bust of Cicero, as, as you do, which Peel, <laughs> which Peel hoped to eventually replace with a portrait of the Swedish naturalist Carl Linnaeus. Museum visitors engaged directly with the smoke eater by opening a door in the chimney's flue to view the wondrous process of smoke consumption. Although this later watercolor of the museum's long room by one of Charles Wilson's many artist children, Titian Ramsey Peel, does not specifically depict this unusual stove, one can imagine its presence among the elevated portrait busts aligned atop the display cases of minerals and shells. Peel expressly designed this device to address two related environmental ills facing Philadelphia, the economy of fuel and the evil of smoke, and those are his terms. It is clear, however, that the appearance and decoration of his fireplaces and stoves were as important to Peel as their efficient operation. With its erect form and internal circulatory system topped by a sculpted head, the smoke eater evokes a human body and appearance, structure, and process of consumption. Peel's design, therefore, became an ideal model for his vision of a physically healthy self, a stove efficiently inhaling oxygen and expelling or consuming noxious smoke mirrored bodily mechanisms of circulation, respiration, and even digestion. Peel's smoke eater took on a special urgency amid recurring concerns about health and air quality, as Philadelphia suffered almost annually from devastating outbreaks of yellow fever. Many physicians believed that the city's corrupted air and the combustion of fuel exacerbated the disease. The smoke eater, therefore, in its rational classical form, provided an ideal counterpoint to the messy, amorphous, fever-racked body that haunted Philadelphia's citizens. This technological body could be controlled and manipulated, and its sooty interior and byproducts were contained and consumed, improving air quality for the general populace. Certain bodies, however, occupied a more tenuous position in this discourse on environment, air quality, and public health. Peel also exhibited life-size figures of different races in his museum including a, quote, sooty African, end quote. Such a term denotes a close period association between soot, black skin, and disease. Because the position was so hazardous and undesirable, chimney sweeping was overwhelmingly conducted by free black men and young boys in the decades after the Revolutionary War, as illustrated by the wood engraving on the right from the cries of Philadelphia. The almost indeterminate figures that populate this image include a figure emerging from or descending into the chimney of a, the structure in the background, like a puff of smoke. Because physicians initially believed they were immune to yellow fever, the city's black population also became visible harbingers of death, as they were enlisted as nurses, corpse collectors, and hearse drivers during the 1793 epidemic. Within Peel's museum, a visitor could view the smoke eater and its whitewashed neoclassical form, consuming smoke and soot, epitomized by the nearby wax African figure's dark skin. Such a display provided audiences with two contrasting versions of the body, one mechanical, clean, and rational, and the other sooty and unsanitary. Within the context of an increasing population of freed blacks in Philadelphia following the American Revolution and Pennsylvania's gradual abolition of slavery, Peel stoves reinforced the social hierarchy on display within his museum and reaffirmed white male superiority at a time of social and environmental change. Attending to the environmental context of Peel's fireplace and stove designs, therefore, uncovers a rich and complex story connecting deforestation, air pollution, public health, and race in early national Philadelphia, one shaped by both human and non-human protagonists. By revealing the previously unexplored environmental significance of select examples of visual material culture, my project asserts that environmental conditions and change played a significant part in shaping artistic production and urban growth in the decades following United States independence. 
Although I focus on one particular early Republican city, Philadelphia's problem was ultimately a national and even international problem in which art and embodied environmental perception played a crucial role. Bringing these past ecological stories to light is, I believe, an important responsibility not only of art history, but of the humanities as a whole, as we face our own environmental crisis today and in the future. Thank you. Thank you. So the smoke eater suggests that all manufacturers of e-cigarettes need to do is put a bust of Cicero at the top. <laughs> well, thank you so much for this incredibly stimulating series of, of talks on work supported by the ACLS. I'd like to open the floor for questions to any of the three speakers. If you could go to one of the microphones. Well, I'll, I'll start with a question. Uh, I wanted to ask uh, Stephen Berry about some of the, the narratives of the uh, coroner's reports. Uh, you pointed out that these reports bring us an unparalleled opportunity to hear a kind of multiplicity of voices from the past in which slaves might be given their own, uh, their own voice, their own words. In looking, is there a seamless narrative with a single does the coroner try to homogenize these voices into some kind of officialese, or uh, do the quotations, what kinds of, of presence is given to the voices embodied in them? So the, the testimony that slaves give is translated through whoever is taking effectively a deposition. That's, that's what he's doing. Um, so you're not getting necessarily a word for word. You're getting a sense of what they saw or uh, what data they might have that might contribute to an understanding of how this person has, has died. I should say, um, in thinking about the coroner, uh, my thinking has been shaped a lot by Laura Edwards' book, A People and Their Peace, um, which basically suggests that historians have focused too much at state level law, which never was applied to the county level. At the county level, uh, the law that most people saw and wanted was called the people and their peace. And the piece is just whatever was true yesterday should be true tomorrow. And so when there are dislocations in this communitarian sense of how things should be, it is the job of the sheriff and the coroner uh, to figure out how to heal that social rift. So while for us what we want the coroner to be is a medical examiner who is after medical certainty, um, that's not what the coroner's job is in that community. Uh, the coroner's job is to hear all sides uh, try to figure out what happened, and then try to come to a conclusion that everybody in the community is going to be able to live with. So it's not going to be justice, and it is not going to be science or forensics or certainty. Uh, it is a much more communitarian operation. So the view that we get of slaves is refracted, certainly, uh, through that. But we at least get to see them where we don't. By the time you get to any other court, Right now you're at jury nullification. Now nothing is going to happen. Now it's going to leave no footprint at all. So here we at least have some small footprint. Thank you. If you don't want to go to a microphone, you could just leap to your feet and ask a question. Nicola. Uh, thank you so much for your talk. They were fabulous. I'm an artist historian, so let me ask Laura and open uh, question. So if 19 regarded matter as animate or vibrant that had its own kind of self or life, how might that have affected the way makers approached matter? So how would that change our current ideas of material culture in the late or mid 19th century era? Thank you for that question. Sorry, just adjusting that. Um, I, th I think maybe the best way to answer that question is I might uh, draw from a case study that's in my dissertation um, on William Rush, the, that unusual self-portrait that I just showed you. Um, and I think how recognizing the vibrant matter of materials, how that might uh, be manifested um, in the way that artists approach materials, I think I, I've... I found kind of an answer in, in his working practice, Rush's working practice. So Rush primarily worked with wood, although he did um, make some terracotta portrait busts, as you just saw. Um, and the way 
We don't have a lot of documentation from Rush about his working practice, but we do have uh, others commenting on it, and they very much describe it as, a, as almost a collaboration of artist and material. It's not just the artist imposing his vision on the work, uh, it's the artist seeing something that's already there in the work and working with the material in the ways that uh, it would allow to be to be worked essentially. Um, and so you see a lot of and you see a lot of mention in accounts about Rush as him, as he he would say, well, it's you know that the the figure is in the wood. I just have to uncover it. Um, so recognizing that that matter does play an art an important role, I think, in artistic practice. Um, and it's something I think artists recognize too, even speaking with contemporary artists, they recognize that their materials act a certain way and do certain things. Um, and sometimes trying to do something the material doesn't want to do ends up, ends up in, a, in a failure, or, or maybe not, I guess, in some ways as well. Thanks. Tom. The wonderful freeze there you gave, showed us with the um, the uh, lion attacking the bull. Can you give us a little background? What was the imperial understanding of that, of that image? And I noticed that there was a flanking one on the other side too. So what was the Persian read of that particular image? Right, it's, it's a great question. And part of what undermines the, uh, the interpretation that the economist seems to want us to, to read is that you have a bull in the position of a prey, which doesn't really work. Uh, so one uh, well-known Achaemenid art historian named Margaret Root has written about this, and she has argued that actually it's a uh, kind of erotic scene of uh, an erotic encounter that's uh, meant to participate in a broader Persian uh, emphasis on sort of fecundity, fertility, abundance that's linked to the Persian concept of the paradise and a number of sort of related uh, sort of metaphysical uh, notions that link um, that linked the natural world with the final restoration of perfect order, uh, a kind of eschatological vision of what the world will be like, what, will, what the world will look like again when perfection is restored ever since its fall. Uh, so more along the lines of, of abundance, fertility, and the natural world's participation in the restoration of cosmic order. Uh, I have a question for Dr. Barry. Um, I'm impressed uh, about how your project uh, uh, introduces us to the voices of people who are often considered voiceless. Um, for those of us who, who teach American History Survey, et cetera, uh, one, one of the generalizations we often throw out is that uh, people of color were not allowed to testify in trials and things like that, but, but you have at the coroner inquest slave testimony. What kind of weight did that carry? Well, uh, again, in this view of a community where the peace is what needs to be most protected, what was true yesterday needs to be true tomorrow, I think is much more supple and it helps us make sense of uh, work like Adam Rothman's book, um, Notorious in the Neighborhood, which is basically looking at um, interracial cohabitation in the antebellum South, which did happen. Uh, and it would be common knowledge in the community. It just couldn't become public knowledge. It couldn't become notorious. That's what happened to Jefferson. He became notorious for something that was common. Uh, knowledge. And so their testimony can have weight. They do have a say, uh, women and slaves, because they can speak uh, more than certainly strangers or someone who hasn't been in the community for as long to what was true yesterday. Um, so they do have some say, not as much. I mean, the, the 14 uh, bodies that are standing over the deceased are all white men. The doctor is a white man, the coroner is a white man, the state is represented by white men. Um, there are realities. They will be the judge, ultimately, uh, and preside over death. But um, they do have a say in the people's peace. Thank you, uh, all three of you, for wonderful uh, praises of your exciting work. I have a question that could be answered by any of you. Um, you made it clear to this group, which of 
course, is scholarly and it's our intention of what's significant about your work. But I wonder how you talk about these things to wider, less expert audiences, undergraduates, the public, Laurie, in your case, journalists. Um, what's been your experience with explaining this and making it meaningful for uh, wider audiences? Well, I, I can start by commenting on undergraduate teaching and conveying uh, the importance of things in shaping our world, which is very easy to do these days. You just ask your students to take out what's in their pockets and the iPhones will come hitting the tables. And I mean, there are all sorts of ways in which one can approach instruction on the ancient past on some of these things, these themes pertaining to matter by thinking hard about our own relationships to matter, uh, including our relationships to matter as members of a political community, uh, from uh, examples like the, dr the predator drone uh, to, the, to the voting uh, booth and the ballot. I mean, there are all sorts of ways to make these ideas seem more accessible and relevant when we actually stop to think about the ways in which things play a role in our political lives and how much our encounter with the uh, public sphere is mediated by a vast world of objects. So that on teaching and uh, sort of speaking uh, in more accessible ways about politics and things, from my perspective. Uh, so I, I, I imagine many of you heard on Tuesday that uh, there was a, a recent national climate assessment report that just came out, which said very emphatically that climate change is not a concern of the future. It's, a con it's happening now. It's something we're facing today. Um, and, and I also, I was just reading yesterday um, in the paper how a recent poll showed that only 44% of Americans believe that the climate is changing because of human activity, which is on, a, on the very low end in terms of what other developed countries believe. So I think how I would explain what I study is that I think how the humanities can contribute to this discussion is to study the environmental contacts, uh, contexts of the past as well, because if we don't, if we ignore the way, the importance that the important role that the environment plays uh, in art history, in history, um, in literature, uh, then we're, we're contributing to this conversation that the environment doesn't matter. Um, and so that's what I hope my research is doing in terms of what impact it might have. It, it proves that the environment matters and it has mattered for a long time. It's impacted a wide variety of, um, of, of points in our history. I suppose I'll just uh, echo that. One of my uh, thoughts is that presentism uh, in historical circles is a sin. It's turning the dead into political sock puppets to spout your party line. Um, but present value, our work really ought to have that. Uh, and I think I teach a course on, on death and dying um, at the University of Georgia. Um, and the students come with a kind of morbid curiosity. And I have them write their eulogy and their epitaph and um, <laughs> ju just to get into it. Um, but I'll, and, and, and then I get, that gets them out of this notion that they're immortal. Um, and, and also that we share something um, with the people that we're studying. We're, we're all making our mortal way to the grave um, so that if they can at least start to empathize uh, with that, those people, I think that's important. If I can get them to see that who dies is a social justice question, um, then when they look at who's bobbing in the Ninth Ward after Katrina, they'll start asking some hard questions about how that came to pass. That's actually a, a, a great question to consider in this afternoon's panel, too, since we're talking about the public face of the humanities. And so ways in which uh, the, the material turn, all the uh, ideas, both the composition and decomposition of, of things, uh, is quite relevant in, in many, many spheres. Question, yes. Yeah, there's a wonderful trio of presentations uh, on things. You have the body. Uh, the plate, the fireplace, and I wanted to ask all of you, or any of you, uh, how you think about another aspect of matter, which is the architecture in which, in the context of which this is going on, the room in which the inquest is taking place, the room in which the plate is found, the room in which the fireplace is. How do you all think about architecture and how it interacts with what you're thinking about? Uh, sure, I'll, I'll start. Um, so. 
not just not just architecture for me, but also place is very important in my research too. I mean, you might have noticed that it focuses a little bit on Philadelphia, uh, which is this wonderful city where we're all in right now, and I hope you all take time to explore at some point. Um, and I mean, I think what, I, I study things within Philadelphia, but really Philadelphia is the glue that ties it all together. It's the place where I see these changes occurring, um, and not just in the city in terms of air pollution uh, and um, water pollution and concerns about yellow fever, but also in the areas surrounding Philadelphia. My, uh, so the, the forests that are becoming uh, depleted um, as the city consumed these massive amounts of wood. So my, my title of my dissertation is The Opulent City and the Sylvan State, which is Philadelphia and Sylvan State, Pennsylvania. Um, so I'm interested in the way those, those two interact. So that's kind of where place at least comes in. And architecture comes into my dissertation in other ways as well. Actually, one of my case studies is the waterworks, which, which is an architectural structure too. Um, yeah, so a variety of ways for sure. I guess I would just say the same. I, I featured one example uh, that happened to be a, an object as we kind of conventionally understand it, but in the, in the book more broadly, I really don't see a significant difference ontologically uh, between the different categories of objects that we think of as separate, so architecture, built form, natural environment versus, say, man-made objects and so forth, so that there are a number of contexts in the project where stone walls, uh, natural uh, outcrops, um, large palatial type structures are all treated uh, uh, you know, through these same kinds of analyses. And this, uh, in some ways, this four-part analytic that I didn't get into of delegates, proxies, uh, captives, and affiliates is precisely to try and overcome those particular ways of breaking up the material world and thinking of a different way of clustering the world of matter. So it's a good question, and uh, it was just a matter of what example I featured. I'll, I'll say, I, you know, I think I need to give more thought um, to architecture. The, the interesting thing about corners quest, uh, in quests is that they have to take place where the body lies. Um, so that means that they're mappable, which is one of the uh, things that I do. Uh, and we haven't talked about the spatial turn that much, but it seems like we're all uh, focusing on that uh, to some degree. So lots of corners in quests are actually happening outside, so there may be a natural architecture. Where they do occur inside, though, as that cartoon displayed, um, if, you're look, if you're at a plantation and the planter is there and you are in his home, but you are a poor white who owns no slaves. This is an interesting moment when you're looking at uh, what slavery precisely is. So I've certainly given some thought to class and how architecture um, articulates class. And the other thing I think about corners and quests because they have to take place where the body lies, because we can map them uh, and because they're spatial, th there's another thing we share with the dead, right? Not only our mortality, but a place on earth. And I can sometimes get my students to say, oh, this happened here where I'm standing, and they make a different kind of connection than they would otherwise because they share that ground. And I've certainly focused on that a great deal, so more spatial than architectural. Thank you. Thank you, wonderful uh, presentations. This follows up on the architecture and, and space and materiality. I was interested in kind of the ways in which you're envisioning you are doing a, a digital project and you're doing a book project, um, whether you've thought about different ways of presenting this material. I just think it's very rich, the mapping, the um, materials, what you could add. You showed us wonderful examples on the slides. I'm just wondering if you've thought about different ways in which you can represent this and maybe, maybe make it interactive. So I'm just I wondered your thoughts on that. Uh, it's a timely question because uh, <laughs> having come to this very kind of realization, uh, my colleagues and I, so I'm a co-director of a, a large field project uh, in Armenia called Project Aragats, the project for the archaeology and, and geography of ancient Transcaucasian societies. And we are in the midst of a massive overhaul of our database and online presence precisely uh, as a kind of realization that uh, what we've had until now, which has been a rather internal digital environment for those of us who you know, do data entry on the most sort of nitty gritty level is just no longer adequate uh, in, this, in this age of digital humanities. So uh, we're in the midst of revamping this so that uh, there will be both a, 
uh, open sort of access point into the database and different ways for uh, any user to to draw, call up and uh, bring into different kinds of associations artifacts and other findings from our from our excavations uh, as well as a, a a closed sort of more private uh, environment for for direct data entry so it's certainly something that we're grappling with I can't say that I have a particularly good solution or have come up with a particularly good solution on the tech side. So I was very interested to hear uh, Stephen's presentation of, of uh, his, uh, I hesitate to say book, but digital environment of a constantly evol evolving um, uh, um, content. So that was new for me to hear about and exciting. So. I, I think, well, one, one uh, so this is my dissertation that I, I presented a sort of short summary of today. but. Um, I've also been thinking about how it might work as an exhibition as an alternative form um, because many of the objects that I study are in storage essentially in diff these different institutions. Those fireplace models are not on display when you guys, I saw that the American Philosophical Society Museum is advertising their Jefferson exhibition and so you won't find these fireplace models on display in that exhibition at all. So I think it could be I was thinking my dissertation could be an interesting way to pull these, these objects together um, and to tell a story about Philadelphia's art and environmental history that hasn't really been told before, and that could be a way to engage the public um, in a, you know, more beyond the dissertation for sure. So that's something I'm thinking about. Well, and, I, and I'll just say that CSI Dixie has been uh, consciously designed as an experiment in form. I can afford, I actually, I do have tenure. They, they made a huge mistake. Um, <laughs> And, and so I think it's incumbent upon me. I'm, I'm the co-director of the Center for Virtual History at the University of Georgia. I head the campus's Digital Humanities Initiative. If I'm going to bring in graduate students, if we are going to make new assistants, assistant hires uh, and expect them to do digital humanities work, I think that, that the people who can afford to do it, um, who don't need the academic credit, uh, need to be sort of first into the breach and make the argument, hey, this is a book. It's just been cut into pieces, and, uh, and it may look a little different for you. Um, but this is um, this should count toward tenure. This should count fully toward a book. We need a peer review process of some kind. We need to redefine what a dissertation is. Uh, and so we're really in early days of all of those uh, things. And so I, I thought it was incumbent upon me, because I can afford to do it, um, to try it out. And I, I'm sure I'll fall down and stumble and, and fail. And that'll be part of the point. We have time for one more question. Thinking a step further about the sustainability, and so on, we were talking earlier about the three and a half inch floppy drives that we have. Um, and, you know, and what's the architecture of, or what's the means of preserving? When you were talking, Lori, about the exhibition, which sounds fascinating, that gets sedimented perhaps as the catalog that carries forward the exhibition comes and goes, it can be perhaps reinstantiated, but the, the risk perhaps, uh, and I'm all with you on, on this should count in the highest possible way, how do we, we make sure that 20 years from now it's like, you remember that thing that we used to be able to do and see? Um, I, I'm counting on the NSA really to... <laughs> I think that's true, and I've, I've, I'm, I'm not as involved in the digital humanities as, as Steve is. But from what I've heard, it's, um, I mean, it's that's a, that's a fear, right, about these these technologies becoming obsolete, and, and people I've heard um, people who do GIS mappings and, and things like that, and they just can't even like they, it's like they almost lose that <laughs> that um, that interface at some point. Um, in terms of an exhibition and and a cat and you know a catalog and how do I how do you like preserve that going forward? I think, I mean, I think in a, what would probably be most important to me is the dialogue maybe it generated, and I would hope that that would have a lasting effect. Um, yeah, just to get the conversation started and to have to have that going forward. It doesn't help preserve floppy drives, unfortunately. That answer. <laughs> Well, it's a fascinating question about the material turn and how to actually materially preserve the, the work that, you, that you're all doing. Uh, we may have time for another question that I... Yeah. I have a question for 
on how you were going to get younger scholars um, doing this type of work, get it peer reviewed. In terms of thinking about more formal publication mechanisms that involve peer review, um, do you imagine working um, within your institution in collaboration with presses, scholarly societies? How do you imagine that that publication and peer review mechanism might take shape? Do you have any ideas? Um, I, I, yes, I mean, I, I think some of it can happen on campus. And in fact, our digital humanities lab is located in main library and is right next to the University of Georgia Press. And presses will always um, the expertise they'll bring to the table is about marketing, is about peer review. Um, I think those things will never go away if we move to a digital um, platform. So I absolutely see traditional university presses moving to sort of play that role. But the conversation that we're having uh, about peer review, um, uh, about what is credit uh, for toward tenure, that, that is happening um, much more across the nation. Uni university of Nebraska-Lincoln has put a lot of material online. Here's a draft of what the de uh, history department, uh, here's new language that you could use in terms of what counts as a dissertation, in terms of what counts as a monograph for credit. What do you think? And a lot of us are redrafting that. And, and, and so it's much more of a national conversation that I see taking place right now. One of the things that has emerged from this session is the extraordinary voices of the past that our fellows have, have brought forth, uh, pasts that have now been uh, made to speak to the present in really powerful ways. And I'd like to thank Stephen, Laurie, and Laura, uh, and thank you for the session. Thank you.